the retro ups and downs, the long promised, often thought of, and here we are, version of the ups and downs. So, as you know, we're going to be going through the best of both worlds today. You voted, we listened, thank you so, so much. Um, a really, really quick uh, bit of housekeeping is that here's how we're going to do these going forward. What we're going to do is we're going to pick four episodes for a poll. We're going to have a critically acclaimed episode, a historically less than great episode, a funny episode, and an episode that we feel is often overlooked. And we will put those up for a vote every single time that we're putting out one of these polls. And based on how the majority answer, that will decide the episode that we do. I am already throwing a spanner in the works by... I am heading away for a couple of weeks. So we're going to, of course, do the best of both worlds today. Rather than put a big gap between the next one, we're going to also do the second most popular answer on our recent poll, which is Threshold. So we will be doing that one as well in the next episode of the Retro Ups and Downs, and then we will revert to the polls again after that. This is a bit of an experiment. So we're going to, we're going to need your feedback what you liked, what you didn't like, what you would like to see more of, what you would like to see less of. All feedback is good feedback. Okay, are you with me? Will we get going? Let's do this. I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here are all of the ups and downs for Star Trek The Next Generation, the best of both worlds. <laughs> This classic episode opens in chilling fashion with the Enterprise in orbit of Jure 4 and where once stood the new Providence colony. The very first up of this episode is that chilling opening scene. You have that very tense score playing, you have no response to the hails from the Enterprise and when Riker and his team beam down to what O'Brien assures them is the middle of town. They find that giant scooped out crater in the ground. Second up, because not only is that a bloody terrifying sight, it also directly reminds us of the end of season one, the neutral zone, that also teased this type of encounter with the Borg. After our opening credits, we get the arrival of our two new characters for this two-parter. The first is Shelby. Now, she is definitely an up for me. Elizabeth Dennehy is one of the strengths of this story. There's a lot of butting heads and back and forth between her and Riker. But overall, to paraphrase Geordie later in the episode, the episode is stronger for her being there. The other new character is Admiral Hansen. Now, George Murdoch himself is an up for this because he has that gravitas of the gravelly admiral who will do his best in any situation. And although he doesn't know it yet, he is hopelessly outmatched in this situation. There is a down in this opening scene as well. Shelby is in her 20s and, you know, there's a lot of, for all the back and forth between her and Riker, the assertion of Hansen having old man's fantasies with her. It was, frankly, it was uncomfortable at the time and it's uncomfortable now. It's the phrasing of it. Picard asks, you seem quite taken with her, JP. And he's like, oh, just an old man's fantasy. So I'm just like, okay, yep. It's just the delivery of it. Um, I hope to be having fantasies myself as the years go by. I'm going to move on swiftly from this topic. This scene sets up a very important landscape for Starfleet, and that's they're not ready to face the Borg. They were expecting, based on the fact that the Enterprise encountered the Borg at system J25, which is almost 7,000 light years away, that they would have more time. They're talking about this new type of weapon systems that are now under development, uh, which we know will resurface in a few years in another show. Starfleet, as it stands, does not have the armaments or the tactical capabilities to face the Borg in anything like they're needed. That is another one of the serious strengths of the best of both worlds, particularly part one, is it's our, you know, our heroes, our regular characters going, I don't think we can win this. 
That's frightening as an audience. Now, we know as well, this is an episode that has actually gotten stronger as time has gone on because we know what the Borg are capable of. Anyone watching this today will have almost definitely seen things like First Contact, they'll have seen Voyager. We know what the Borg can do. This discussion of the Borg was incredibly creepy at the time and has only gotten creepier as time has gone on because even knowing they're not ready, they are still underestimating the Borg. Now, that's not to suggest that this episode isn't without its levity. Shelby joins Riker for the uh, poker game on Deck 8. So we have Troy, we've got Crusher, we've got Data, Geordi, and we've got Wesley. I want to give an up to Will Wheaton in this episode because this is Ensign Wesley Crusher, who's as green as green can be. Although he doesn't get an awful lot to do here, this is what I think some of the peak Wesley was, is that he is able to be both the young and inexperienced officer or poker player, but also does it in such a way that you feel for him. Very, very early Wesley, they were still finding their feet with the character and Wesley later on would be quite different as well. This is pretty much Wesley in his prime. And oh, I'm sorry, but Wesley's face when he realizes he's been bluffed by Riker, that's an up as well. What we see a lot of in part one is the, the friction between Riker and Shelby. There are times when it feels like Riker's in the wrong. There are times when it feels like Shelby's in the wrong. And there are times when it feels like both of them are correct and they're just not communicating properly. It has that range that stops it from making one or both of them unreasonable. Although, now, I will say Shelby taking data and beaming down to the planet without informing anyone, although, yes, she is a lieutenant commander and she is, you know, she is the specialist on the Borg. You still should let people know if, if there's a change in the plan or something like that. It's that is not enough for a down, but Put it this way, I can see why Riker's annoyed. Even Geordi sees why Riker's annoyed. Um, as he says to Data, um, yep, she aired. And that's it. It is, it's, it's, it's more of a mistake than out and out, well, it's not insubordination, but it, it, it's really digging the heels in of the frustration here. Now, the fact that she does go ahead and confirm what we all knew, that yes, it was the Borg, that, you know, that sort of sets the clock ticking a little bit faster, especially then as they detect the Borg on long range sensors. Now, this is where the episode really begins to kick into gear. Within seeming minutes, you have the Enterprise D and the Borg Cube engage. Uh, this is, they're, they're, they are on their own. There's no support from Starfleet because Starfleet is still six days away. I was going to down that. I was going to down the fact that, you know, is there no bloody ships in the system? But again, we have to look at this in the context of the time. This is before the Dominion War. Frankly, this is before the real rise of even the Romulans as a threat to Starfleet. Starfleet is very much an exploration organization at this point. So fleets and fleets of starships aren't required at this point. The nearest help is six days away. Sure, that does sound like a long time, um, and it is, you know, there might, you might think that there's maybe one or two ships that are in vicinity. Yeah, it's, it's one of the big points of, of this is that we can't get to the Borg in time, but what we will do is consolidate at another section, which we'll get to now in a moment, of course. The Enterprise engages the Borg and the Borg directly hail Captain Picard. This is one of those ones that really plays well when you know about assimilation, when you know about how the Borg operate, is that this is highly unusual. On the flip side, you know, back when Michael Piller was writing these episodes, they were effectively making this up as they went along. You know, what did assimilation look like, in, you know, toward the end of season three of The Next Generation? Well, it didn't look anything like it did when you get to Voyager and First Contact, things like that. The idea of hailing Picard is very unsettling. The Borg attack, they do their best to modulate shields and to fire phasers at a rotating frequency. And thankfully, thanks to some quick thinking by Data, 
taken up, they are able to break off the Borg's tractor beam. However, it does come at the loss of 11 lives with eight unaccounted for in engineering. And although this might sound grim, we do get the Geordie roll out of it. We love a Geordie roll. The Enterprise warps away. It hides in the Pulsan Nebula, which is very familiar to anyone who's seen the Wrath of Khan. We get a couple of scenes in quick succession. One is where they're trying to assess what to do next. I mean, the Borg are hopelessly outmatching them here. What do we do? They start to come up with this idea that will become the deflector dish, give it a big enough bang that will unfortunately destroy both ships unless they can figure out a way to extend the range of the deflector. So that's Wesley and Geordi's plan for the next while. Shell becomes up with the plan of separating the saucer section as a multi-platform attack and distract the Borg, confuse them. And Riker says, it's too dangerous. And if we think about what we know about the Enterprise-D, I mean, the saucer section is very much a large life raft. It's not really, not the, not the Galaxy-class ship is not really designed to be another form of attack. It's more of a way of letting the civilians escape while the drive section engages the enemy. You can see Riker's point here. He might be a bit quick to dismiss Shelby's idea, I will say that. And this, of course, leads to the conversation between Riker and Geordi, where they both agree that, look, she's a full head of steam, but their chances are better with Shelby than without, and Riker agrees. Now, where I have the down is Shelby going over Riker's head. Whatever about beaming down to Jure 4 without informing anyone, okay, this is a direct overstep. Like him or not, Riker's the first officer of this ship. Now, you might be assigned to this ship and you might be assigned to the head of a department, but you are still subservient to the first officer of that ship. And he has already said, I will bring this to Captain Picard. She went around him. He is absolutely right to be pissed off at her for going over his head to Picard. And Picard then, you know, says, look, we're going to consider this. You know, it's not the right time for it, but let's keep it in the back pocket. Riker joins her in the turbo lift. And again, as I say, you understand Riker's frustration. However, for the down of Shelby going over his head, she is absolutely right in at least her estimation that he is in her way. And if he can't make the big decisions, he needs to get out of the way for someone who can. Now, look, there's more to that than just someone who can make split decisions in the moment. But you can absolutely understand why from someone's point of view, Riker is standing still and he's just letting his career go by. He's just turned down his third command. From these point of views, he sort of needs to get himself together. Now, even with the kick up the bum from Picard, uh, it does seem that Riker is not yet ready to move on. You also have, for example, he has that chat with Deanna Troy. Uh, now, fun fact, that chat with Deanna Troy about what am I still doing here? I like these things about me. Writer Michael Piller was effectively writing his own inner monologue in that scene. He was, you know, he'd only signed a one year contract at this point. And he was thinking about moving on or should I stay? I don't know. So there's a very interesting counterpoint with real life in that scene. We then move to a, a scene of, I mean, you can't stay in the Pulsar Nebula for long. Um, they need to stay there for a while. They need to do repairs. There is a down in this, and this happens a lot. Uh, Next Generation, guilty of it. Voyager, very guilty of it. Geordi, after doing his cool role, said, you know, we took heavy damage, 11 people died, eight unaccounted for, and engineering looks like it's just been rolled off the showroom floor. It's not the only episode ever guilty of it, but it's absolutely, it must be called out. It is one thing that, unfortunately, Star Trek did slash does suffer from a lot. If you've suffered heavy damage, act like it. This is, however, part of Picard's, you know, touring of the ship before the battle, which leads him to 10 forward and that wonderful discussion with Guinan. Now, of course, Guinan will always get an up because she's just brilliant. Um, but stick around for the observations at the end because there's an incredibly important 
reference to a part of Star Trek's history in this scene, which is interrupted by effectively depth charges being fired by the Borg cube. The Enterprise is forced to escape from the nebula, punch it up to warp 9, and it does bupkis. The Borg lock on with their tractor beams, and we see the first drones in clear realization of the episode, and we guess resistance is futile. Boom. First time it's been said in Star Trek, and it's chilling. Again, we know the weight that goes behind that phrase, but also it is just chilling regardless. Picard is captured by the Borg, and knowing what we know now about assimilation, it's obviously very different. It's, it's not what we would come to expect of assimilating a character. Now, you still get Riker and Worf are both tossed to the side. In the moment, you're writing this as all the Borg want is Picard and, and you know, that's nothing else matters. In retrospect, the Borg need Picard, but they have a larger plan. Now, the Enterprise follows the Borg cube and Riker begins to organize an away mission to rescue the captain. Of course, he says he's going to lead it, but he can't. He is now the commander of the Enterprise at a time of war. So he orders Shelby to take command of the away mission, which, by the way, Action Crusher, delighted to see her getting something to do. Um, completely outside the rule book, and why would you send your chief medical officer? Uh, you said a medical officer, but why would you send the chief medical officer over? Anyway, how or never, great to see her having fun. Now the thing is, at the end of the day, they get there, they, they do figure out a way to slow the Borg cube down, great, and they shoot a bunch of the Borg, great, and then they realize, up, frighteningly so, the Borg wanted them to see Picard. He is semi-assimilated. He has got his Borg components on and they're unable to save him. And so they beam back to the Enterprise Deep and they walk on and tell Picard or tell Riker he is a Borg. He's been altered, which of course leads us to the view screen comes on and we get I am Locutus of Borg up. It's one of the most iconic moments in Star Trek history. And it's as good today as it was then. To be topped only with Mr. Worf fire up. You have to imagine how it felt to be like, this is the end of a season. We've now got a whole Three months to wait for the next part. Oh, sweet summer child. Everything in this scene, from the musical score to the countdown to the order to fire, it is, in a word, perfect. Which is why the cliffhanger between the two is the latinum up of this episode. And that's everything. And you know what they say, to be continued. And now the continuation. Now, coming through with something that never fails to make me laugh. Down. Mr. Worf hit fire. They all went off to the hair salon and came back again. Uh, it, they're not even close. Uh, you know, Dr. Crusher's hair is particularly different here. But then, yeah, Riker's hair is different and Worf's hair is different. And it's kind of like, hmm, which of these scenes were filmed not right beside each other? Uh, which is quite funny. Immediately, this is followed by quite a creepy scene in which Locutus calls Riker number one, explaining that all of the life experiences of Captain Picard are part of the Borg now. This is scary, but what's scarier then is when the Enterprise contacts Admiral Hansen to let him know what happened. At Tiny Quick Down, Admiral Hansen's comm badges sideways for a while, so, you know, we're just having all the fun with the pips and comm badges in this episode. Hansen is gathering a fleet of ships together at Wolf 359. Had to get an up. Of course it did. It absolutely had to get an up. And I want to go a little bit further. I want to call out a couple of fantastic projects. The Battle of Wolf 359 has largely yet to be shown in Star Trek. Now, we did get that scene at the beginning of Emissary, but the battle itself, due to budgetary reasons, was never shown. However, there is an incredible YouTube channel and creator called JTFX who has created a digital version of the battle. And I, I cannot stress enough how beautiful that looks. Also, you've got the, the Wolf 359 project online who have written an oral history of Wolf 359 as well. This is one of the least seen 
and most explored battles in Starfleet history. I really encourage you to check out both of those projects. Now, if you want a slight teaser, uh, while Riker is having a conversation with Guinan, when Guinan is trying to encourage him to gotta let Picard go, Riker says, I, did you not see me? I just tried to kill him. And she says, no, you didn't. You tried to kill whatever's on that ship. You didn't try and kill Picard. And it's incredibly important difference. Perhaps the most chilling thing in the entire episode, I suppose in the run up to what we see afterwards is Admiral Hansen saying the fight does not go well, Enterprise. And then he says, we are attempting to regroup at, the line goes dead and Data just shakes his head. It's an up because it's frightening. Riker obviously is now in command of the Enterprise. He's been given a field commission of captain by Hansen before the uh, signal cut out. And there's a little bit of a reshuffle, of course, of the chain of command. There is a moment that he doesn't come across well, and it's a down for me. And that is that he has reluctantly chosen Shelby for his first officer. Now we know it's a down because we know they're not getting along, but that's like telling everyone in the room, well, she's not my first choice, but I guess, ugh. I get that they don't like each other. I get it. They even say as much. We don't have to like each other to work well together. And that's fine. But Riker didn't come across well in that moment. This all leads up to one of the most well-known scenes in all of the next generation. And there's very little action in it. The aftermath of the Battle of 0359. What we see is a collection of kit-bashed ships floating, burning in space. And it is grim, folks. Again, this is before the Dominion. This is before, you know, things like Species 8472. This is certainly before, you know, things like Discovery, when massive battles became something quite commonplace. This was an entirely absent battle and the Federation loses and loses hard. We get a rundown of the ships. Uh, make sure you stick around for observations. I'll go into all of them in a little bit more detail, but th 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 this is probably about as scary as the next generation had got up to this point. The looks on everyone's faces in this scene, everyone is coming out swinging. And it's one of the last big moments of the episode because part two of The Best of Both Worlds does tend to focus a little bit more on character and a little bit more on, you know, the, 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 the resolution, if you like, is not so much a twist ending as a, a sort of a late in the day denouement. Although the Enterprise is still very much undergoing repairs from the attempted destruction of the Borg Cube, they do manage to catch up to it long enough to stage a rescue mission. Worf and Data, they go via the, uh, the Type 7 shuttlecraft. This allows for one of the last bits of new footage ever filmed on the six foot model of the Enterprise D, which is a saucer separation. Now taken up, because this is the final saucer separation that we see in the run of the next generation. Obviously, it happens again in Star Trek Generations. It's funny to think how early this is the final one. And quite frankly, and quite bluntly, it's because it was a pain in the hoop to get those scenes done. And it slows the pace of the episode. Now, it works very well here because of how the chip is used. But remember, this is Riker using Shelby's plan. And... Picard is briefed on it, but they're able to use the fact that they now know that Locutus knows Picard's history against them. And then we get the fantastic light show, we get the antimatter spread that the saucer section is firing, which Data and uh, Worf use to sort of hide in so that they can beam over to the Borg cube. One of the biggest issues I have with the Borg in general is this whole they'll ignore you till they think you're a threat thing. They really should probably beef up their security because they're able to go over and they're able to take Locutus back with them. And there is a very quick scene where the Borg do discover something's gone wrong. They do identify where the shuttle is and they're able to destroy it. It's very creepy to see how quickly they were willing to sacrifice Locutus, but they are beamed aboard the Enterprise D by down Lieutenant O'Brien. There really was no continuity with the poor chief's insignia. The rest of the episode sort of plays out as 
Locutus, as the intended mouthpiece of the Borg, really trying to, you know, think of his exchange with Worf. Why do you resist? We only wish to raise the quality of life. The Borg believe, at least in this iteration, that they are improving the quality of life for everyone that they assimilate. And this notion of free will, of resisting, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. And that's an up for me because, you know, Michael Piller had a challenge in part two, which was how do we keep them scary, keep them powerful, but also beat them? And the fact that Picard is one of the collective is how they managed to find their Achilles heel. They hook Picard and Data up together by, you know, by connecting Data's neural net to Locutus's Borg components. And the entire exchange is very well done. It's like this is peak Spiner and Patrick Stewart together. I really like it. Um, but there is one thing, it's been, a it's been a down for me forever because it doesn't really make any sense that despite Data connect, making these neural connections and despite Locutus being very much connected to the collective, Picard manages to find a way to overcome the board programming. And that's a down. It's a down because there's this one individual stronger than the entire collective. And also it's sort of become a down as time has gone on because of how much the collective has shown to be more powerful than the individual. If we skip all the way forward to Let Sleeping Borg Lie, remember Zero had not been assimilated, whereas Picard had. The Enterprise manages to catch up to the Borg Cube, which is now in orbit of Earth. Oh dear. The Borg turn around and as per usual, they begin to attack again. And the tractor beam fires. And the cutting beam then locks on to, with a little bit of reused footage, that same section of the engineering hull. And Worf says, will I evacuate the affected areas, sir? Now at the same time, Data and Picard have made contact. Picard has suggested put all the Borg to sleep. Data's putting it into operation. And so Riker says, hold off, Mr. Worf. Whopping massive down. I don't care if you have a piece of paper that says, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. Will I evacuate the affected areas? Yes. Of course you do. Look at how quickly they managed to get through the hole the last time. 11 people dead and eight unaccounted for. And now it's like, ah, hang on. Let's let's just see how this one plays out. Down. On the one hand, they thankfully the plan works and Data is able to insert a command that puts all the Borg back into regeneration. Fantastic. So Shelby takes an away team consisting of Worf and Gleason, who's getting an up just because, hi Gleason. It also confirms, however, that there's a feedback loop that has set the cube to self-destruct. Whoops. They do say, there's the question is asked, well, do we, do we just leave the Borg? We could study them. Data even says, look, I could use the extra time. And Riker makes the call. No, the risk is too great. Get off the cube. Let's get out of here now. And then we get that massive explosion. Bye-bye, Borg cube. Uh, also, last time, Borg cube is seen in Star Trek The Next Generation. We do get one thing. So Picard then sort of like wakes up. Now he's had some of his Borg components removed, but when he says to Data, sleep, his vocal processor is still there. However, once the collective is severed, that vocal processor, which is a mechanical piece, is missing and it's a down. It's a down because it took me out of the episode. So even though there's this great moment, almost human, and it's a great scene, just the fact the voice is missing, uh, then we get the coda of the episode. Shelby's off to head up the task force to get the fleet back up within a year. Riker still bearing the four pips is he's a bit like, you know, he and Picard say, come when someone rings the doorbell for the ready room. It's a bit of a funny moment. And, and they talk about, you know, we're going to have five weeks of refit time, which means woo, sure leave. And then he leaves. And then we linger on Jean-Luc. And if there was one thing that at this era, of Star Trek they didn't do was they didn't do serialized storytelling. In fact, this was the first two-parter since the original series, The Menagerie. Having Picard show on his face the fact that he is not okay, that is an up. Now, grab a fresh coffee and come join me at the Temporal Observations.
Welcome to Temporal Observations. Now, you might be wondering about the name. We've decided to go with Temporal Observations because as we do eggs for these retro ups and downs, what we're not just going to discuss is how they call back to previous episodes, but how they then get called back to again in the future. So, if you think of the new Providence uh, being scooped out, that was that's a callback to the Neutral Zone ep Season 1 final episode. The Excelsior-class ship that delivers Hanson and Shelby is a reuse, of course, of footage that of the USS Repulse from Season 2's The Child. Itself a new composite of footage of the USS Excelsior. Elizabeth Dennehy would, of course, go on to return in Star Trek Picard, for about 47 seconds. George Murdoch has just come back at this point from playing a rather godly character on Shaka Re. System J25 is of course where the action of Q Who takes place. The reference to Riker not giving a decision on another commission. This time it's the USS Melbourne. Before this it was the USS Ares. This was sort of the catalyst for the episode, the Icarus Factor, where we met Kyle Riker as well. And before the events of The Next Generation, he turned down command of the USS Drake. In the poker game, Data's visor would make several more appearances throughout The Next Generation. And of course, Riker's trombone is sitting there as well, which is a great time for everyone, unless of course you want to hear Nightbird. Later on, we cut to Picard's ready room and we see the lionfish Livingston, named, of course, for David Livingston, producer and director at the time. In the scene where Hansen briefs the Enterprise crew about the fate of the poor USS Lala, this is happening in front of those gold Enterprises that are always just gorgeous. You have everything up to Enterprise D, including the original Enterprise B, which was a standard Excelsior model, and Andrew Probert's concept design of the Enterprise C. The Federation logo appears on the screen as Hansen exits. After Picard is hailed by the Borg, we get our shot of those Borg alcoves that we would see time and again as basically the franchise goes on. We get Majel Barrett's voice as she's telling Geordi, get out of engineering, there's an outer hull breach, and we then get one of those patented Geordi Indiana Jones rolls. The Paulson Nebula is a reuse of the Mutara Nebula from Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, with some new footage of the Enterprise filmed amid smoke to give it a bit of an updated look. This smoke contains dilithium, according to data. We talk about separating the saucer section, which had only happened two times previously in The Next Generation, in Encounter at Farpoint, and again in the Arsenal of Freedom, but wouldn't happen again after this until Star Trek Generations. The officers at Khan and Ops in this scene are wearing the Season 1 and Season 2 jumpsuit uniforms that have the stripe across the shoulders. There doesn't really seem to be any rhyme or reason as to who gets to wear what? Because we see other crewmen walking along in jumpsuits that more closely resemble season three onwards with a solid colour. As Picard tours the ship, he speaks with Guinan and he discusses how Nelson toured the HMS Victory before the Battle of Trafalgar. Now, there's two massive things here. First, the HMS Victory would be the namesake of the ship Geordi served on before the Enterprise D. In fact, there's a scene where you see a beautiful wooden sailing ship model of the HMS Victory in engineering. And of course, Nelson himself would, would in you know, his own history and future, inspire the character of Horatio Hornblower by C.E. Forrester. Horatio Hornblower would in turn inspire Gene Roddenberry right from the beginning. Captain Robert April in the pitch for Star Trek was said to be a Hornblower-like character. And all the way up to Patrick Stewart getting the role of Picard, he was handed Horatio Hornblower books by Roddenberry and said the character of Picard is in there. Guinan assures him that even if this was the end of the Federation, it isn't really, because she would know. The Elorians were assimilated by the Borg. This is something that would go on to play a major plot point in Star Trek Generations, and particularly around the character of Sauron. There's a 3D chess board in 10 Forward. We see our first signs, our first close-up signs in these episodes of the drones with those old shields. For the first time, we get confirmation that the Terran system is Sector 001. We get our first utterance of resistance is futile. Aboard the Borg ship, we see Borg interface, and you know, the, the computer graphics that we would see slightly refined, but right the way up through to the end of Voyager and even into Enterprise as well. We get a reference of Wolf 359, which is where we are going to make our stand, according to Admiral Hansen. There is a, a shot here that is effectively copied for Star Trek First Contact, and it's as the Borg begin to, begin to be aware that there is a threat in their mists. One of their arms raises and the, uh, the pieces begin to activate, while the Borg beyond that 
activates and comes to life. This is given a tribute in Star Trek First Contact by Jonathan Frakes when the shot is almost shot for shot done just outside of main engineering. The Borg text and logos that you see on the various panels are both the first variation of and utterance and you know what would become the main logo that we would see in prominence in episodes like Descent. Now we get our first encounter of Locutus of Borg at this point of course. Now Locutus we would later find out would be he who speaks Mouthpiece of the Borg, makes perfect sense. It's also our very first experience of assimilation. In this instance, assimilation happening in stages. Hansen discusses that they are gathering a fleet of 40 ships at Wolf 359, and Shelby, who then effectively mistakenly says Picard is helping the Borg, Hansen rebukes her by saying, I once saw that young man win the Academy Marathon on Danula 2, that man is not helping the Borg. This leads then to a briefing in the Observation Lounge where Crusher mentions that they could use nanites. Now, nanites had been introduced at the beginning of Season 3 in the episode Evolution. They are microscopic robots that effectively served as the inspiration for nanoprobes. When Guinan comes to speak to Riker in the Ready Room, Guinan asks Riker, did Picard ever tell you why we're so close? There's so much in this. First, we would discover that Picard and, Ry and Guinan met in San Francisco in the late 1800s. That was when Picard had traveled through time and saved Guinan's life. An older version of Picard would then travel back to the 21st century, meeting Guinan again, at this point, bartender of 10 forward, but on Earth, where they would help each other and experience Q again. This is important because the greater the context of this, the more powerful it is when Guinan says, I will let him go, and you need to as well. Riker sits in the ready room chair and does the Picard maneuver, but then is called outside because they've arrived at Wolf 359. On screen, we see the remains of the Melbourne, the Chekhov, the Awani, the Kyushu, the Baran, the Princeton, the Tolstoy, a Constitution class refit and a Freedom class USS Firebrand. Now, there's a couple of things there, but the Constitution class is particularly important because it was added to really hammer home the impression that even if Kirk had been present, he wouldn't have stood a chance against the Borg. There was another thing that the Chekhov is a Springfield class ship. Now, it was to be one of the names of ships called out by Shelby as they're going through the graveyard, but this was changed to the Tolstoy because the writers thought it might be a bit too depressing to hear poor Al Pavel Chekhov's name called out among a list of the dead. We then see the battle bridge, we see the armbands that seem to turn up every other week in Star Trek for some form or another, we see saucer separation, we see the Type 7 shuttlecraft that we first saw, in, you know, way, way, way back, the, the more rounded one, if you like. We get a funny moment of, you know, when Locutus has been captured again and is back aboard the Enterprise, he looks at Data and says, you know, you are primitive and you will be obsolete in the New Order. Well, they change their tune when it comes to first contact, don't they? The Mars defense perimeter um, don't do very well at all. And in fact, they are a reference, well, more so a reference. They're, they're a strange Easter egg because they're not from any of this. They're ma made out of model kits based on Russian subs from the Hunt for Red October. Now, a fairly large Easter egg to that movie would be the fact that Gates McFadden was in it. At one point, uh, Locutus seems to wake up in the t uh, science lab and a uh, security officer goes to stop him and then he definitely gets redshirted over the beam. Poor Data always gets cut off mid-explanation and Riker, when it looks like all is lost, orders Wesley to prepare for a collision course with the cube. This would be a bit of a call, well, a call forward if you like to Worf going, prepare for ramming speed. We already called out Gleason, but I'm calling out Gleason again because, you know, he only turns up one more time and he gets a demotion. Poor Al Gleason. Space Station McKinley gets a name drop here, the one that looks a bit like a crab or a spider. And there's a funny ongoing one where Picard is obviously now devoid of his Borg components. He's got some bandages on, and this is one of the funnier inconsistencies of post-assimilation. You know, for Picard, Janeway, Torres, and Tuvok, you know, the various doctors could just kind of pop them off, everything's fine. For Seven, absolutely not. And in fact, they're so integral to keeping her alive that even when the magical wish thing with Q in season two happened, she had to get them back in. It's because they look good on her. Let's just call it what it is. And of course, we've got that last lingering look, which will only 
come back again and again and again as Picard experiences and re-experiences his trauma of being assimilated. Just some other additional notes, the Borg costumes in this episode are based on the original ones designed by Dorinda Rice Wood. They were updated and adapted by Robert Blackman. Uh, there's also Michael Westmore's son, Michael, found that little laser that sat on the side of Locutus's head. It's one of those things they said that if you tried to do it, it would have cost thousands. The fact he just found a little laser pointer and said, what about this? And they said, that looks amazing. And they did it seriously cheap. This was the first two-parter in Star Trek since the Menagerie. And it also serves, part one serves as Wesley Crusher's only season finale that he filmed scenes for because he wasn't in the neutral zone and Shades of Grey was done with stock footage. You'll notice as well that a lot of LeVar Burton scenes only appear in either close-up or where he's on his own because he filmed a lot of his scenes after this episode had actually wrapped because he was having surgery while the bulk of it was being filmed. Some of the concept models for the Enterprise from Planet of the Titans look appear in the graveyard. The Borg Queen was present, which we find out in First Contact, although she doesn't appear in this, but she didn't need to appear in this. And let's stop thinking three-dimensionally. While we're at it, let's just not think about the humans who were assimilated at Wolf 359 who turn up again in Voyager's episode Unity. This episode was nominated for two Emmy Awards, Best Sound Editing and Best Sound Mixing. And that's everything for this episode of the Retro Ups and Downs. What did you think? Let us know. If you like this, check out. We have a Retro Ups and Downs already for Sub Rosa, and we will be following this with the Retro Ups and Downs for Star Trek Voyagers Threshold. Make sure that you are subscribed to stay up to date with everything. You can follow us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. We're over on Instagram at Trek Culture YT. We're also on Blue Sky and TikTok at Trek Culture. I'm at Sean Ferrick on the various socials. And of course, Chris is at Edit Chris Edit on the various socials as well. Make sure that you look after yourselves until I see you again. It might be a while, but I'll be thinking of you. Jeti dovo i prostvitati. To our friends in the Middle East, we are hoping for a quick ceasefire. Peace needs to return. It is as simple as that, folks. Everyone, make sure that you are having the best life that you can and that you are leading with love and kindness. Make it so.